Well, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Roy Dunn, and welcome to the Dunes Golf and Beach Club, and welcome to the Homebridge Financial Services Real Estate Roundtable. Uh, thanks to each of you for making this morning special, and it will be. I look forward to hearing what each of you has to say about Myrtle Beach, about our real estate market, and about what makes us so attractive to property buyers all around the country. We're in a special time, and we in this room know this, a special time in this market with incredible opportunity, and I'm eager to hear about these opportunities. I'm eager to hear how we take advantage of these opportunities this morning. And I'm excited, too, to be sharing our discussion beyond these walls for the first time to viewers on YouTube. Hi, Mom. <laughs> Get to go see my mom this week uh, for Mother's Day. This morning's roundtable is presented by Homebridge Financial Services. We're one of the largest privately owned mortgage lenders in the country. I have to tell you that. And it's also presented by the Optimal Service Group, which is my origination team and our largest origination team on the Grand Strand. Let me introduce clockwise around the room the participants so everybody knows who's here. Laura Crowther, the CEO of the Coastal Carolina Association of Realtors. Janice Cialiano with uh, Caldwell Banker Shakura, Greg Harrelson with Century 21 The Harrelson Group, Paige Bird, Remax Ocean Forest, Jamie Broadhurst, Century 21 Broadhurst, Nancy Skelly with Remax Southern Shores, and Anna Marie Brock with White Realtors Southern Coast, Martha Thill with Century 21 Bowling, Michael King, King One Properties, Mandy Becker, with Remax Southern Shores, Brendan Payne with Century 21, the Harrelson Group, Matt Harper with Beach Realty Group, and Scott Schultz with the Myrtle Beach Area Chamber of Commerce. It's a talented group, a successful group, and a group that won't be shy with their opinions. <laughs> At least that's what we're hoping for. Now moderating the discussion with me this morning is Michael Maley, who is the main anchor with WNBF TV, our local NBC affiliate. Uh, Michael's duties at the station keep him on the job until the wee hours, so I'm particularly appreciative of you being here this early morning. As a journalist, Michael is required to be uh, both inquisitive and respectful of time constraints, so I thought it'd be good that Michael will guide us along if we start to get a little bit long-winded. There is no format for our discussion today. Don't worry about that. It's, it is simply a discussion. Chime in with your <coughs> thoughts at any point, <coughs> answering any question. Uh, in the past, these have taken a life of their own, these discussions, and we look forward to that. The, uh, the discussion will last approximately an hour and 15 minutes or so, and I promise we'll have you uh, out on time. Be concise with your, with your answers and your discussion, and that will allow us to hear as much from as many as we possibly can in the time allowed. Michael. Great. Thank you very much. Speaking of brevity, on WMF News, if I talk too long in the interviews, I've got a producer screaming in my ear saying, wrap it up. Uh, I know you guys aren't shy, all of you, which is good, but uh, hopefully together we can kind of streamline and keep it moving. It's, it's an honor to be here. It's intriguing to be here, really, because um, so many times the people who watch our station say, what can I do to sell my house? What does it really take to sell my house? And we hear those questions on Facebook, on email, everything. So we're hoping some of your insight here can help all of you, but also maybe some of the viewers too that we're going to hopefully broadcast this to further and beyond. Um, so with that in mind, let's start with what brings home buyers here to the Grand Strand? What do your out-of-state clients tell you initially lures that lures them <coughs> here to the Grand Strand beyond other coastal communities? And then, I guess, furthermore, what do they specifically look for in a home? So what's the draw, really, to get those out-of-towners, whether they're in Cincinnati, Ohio, or New York, or Miami, here? And then what do they look for in the homes or the properties? And you want to start it? Whoever wants to jump in? Whoever wants to jump in. Weather. <laughs> the weather. It has to be weather. Somebody said, I had a client call me yesterday. He was in Pennsylvania, and he had six feet of snow last winter. Wow. He goes, and I'm not doing this again. So I would say that's the number one. To me, that seems to be the number one. I have to say affordability. With um, our taxes being lower, the cost, you can get so much home here as compared to the Northeast and other areas. So I know um, I talk to people all the time and their taxes are lower, 12, 
13, 14 thousand dollars a year. So, I mean, they can live here, you know, annually, utilities, taxes, insurance, you know, everything, and they can just enjoy their um, pension or um, retirement or live on a, you know, work and make a little bit less money, but it's just more affordable to live here. Michael, I think another key factor is our geographic location. 60% of the population of the United States can get here within a day's drive. We still are the, the number one drive to destination on these coasts. Yeah. Also, I'd say families. Once one member uh, moves here, the next thing you know, the father's moving here, the sister's moving here. And so you get to uh, move the whole family down. A positive experience on their vacation usually draws them back. So Myrtle Beach Chambers really put a big push. I'm Canadian, so my parents keep telling me that it's unbelievable how much the exposure has been on the evening TV that they watch on Myrtle Beach and the Chambers. I think they come here, they realize this is something, they go back with a game plan, a two to five year plan, and they usually call while they're here, although that's not an immediate buyer, but it's a pipeline buyer for us. So I think we're doing a great job as a community as a whole, really maximizing their experience so it draws them back. Yeah, I'll echo that because our research uh, of late reinforces the fact that a previous visit uh, experience is what leads to a prospective buyer. And we've been doing so much more. We've been very uh, fortunate that, you know, it wasn't that many years ago that we were only able to market and promote this destination around the Carolinas in a few border states. We're very lucky that we can have television advertising up in Toronto, uh, up in the Northeast, and continue to inspire people with new messages about all the different diverse experiences along our 60 miles of coastline. So all the factors that you guys mentioned all bundle up into it, but it's really that high lifestyle and affordability that really seems to package us well together. Let me add one more thing to piggyback off with Mike and, and uh, I think you said affordability. No, you said, somebody said affordability, mm -hmm. but also the diversity of product that we have to offer. We've got golf, we've got ocean, we've got waterway, we've got first time home buyer product that's, that's very affordable. We've got the luxury market that to a lot of people in the Northeast, our luxury market is actually not that high priced, but it is a, a luxury product. So there's a lot of diversity in the product that we have. So we can draw not just one specific segment of the real estate market, we cover pretty much every segment of the, the every, anything anyone would want, we pretty much have it to offer. Now, as a realtor, as an individual realtor, do, do any of you market specifically to an area, a specific market away from here? Mine, excuse me, mine needs to, not needs to be, but tends to be um, the Northeast because I moved here from New Jersey. So I have a, a dad base of 25 years in the title industry that brings a lot of the people, a lot of my clients to this area. And, uh, you know, it's just, as you say, it's a one day drive. It, they're not that far. They can get back to their families with very ease and not have to get on an airplane, things like that. So it's just, it's probably just because of my background and the, the context that I have. Do any of the firms, any of your brokers, do you do you advertise? Well, we indicate we <coughs> advertise. We advertise to a certain degree, but I indicate to a lot of our agents. We have our marketplace. We have so many realtor professionals that come here from other locations as well. And just like Martha, we indicate to them: make sure that you contact and stay in touch with that sphere of influence that you had when you had a career in be it Ohio, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, et cetera, because those are people that potentially could move here. Those are business contacts you had in your previous career. So there's a ways to network and stay in touch with those people that are already in another location looking to potentially move to the Myrtle Beach and Grand Strand area. Do you use specific, do you use statistics, do you use numbers that, that are provided by the chamber and the board, and, or do you, use, do you market the amenities of Myrtle Beach that you've described? How do you approach it? I think it's a combination of everything. Um, uh, I have a, a small office up in the Toronto, Canada area area called Mississauga and I do advertising there. Basically it's a lead capturing office um, and I get a lot of people from the Toronto area and I just recently opened an office in Fort Lauderdale and I'm getting a lot of South Floridians that are interested, well transplants and we call them halfbacks because they'll be up from the northeast, <coughs> they'll go down there, it's a little hot in the summertime and there's not the four seasons like we have here so I capture them there and, and bring them back up here to Myrtle Beach. Works well. Now, Jamie, you and I talked about some statistics that, that you found 
Tell me about that. Yeah, we were, I was recently um, Carolina Living and the Brandon Agency here uh, locally had done a survey, and they had actually done the survey in 06 and 07. Marketplace was a little bit different, uh, uh, and they did it in, a, in comparison to 2012-2013. And I, what I what I saw, there were some uh, huge differences. Uh, number one, uh, the state of origin of people that moved to the Grand Strand, um, Florida, for example, has fallen off about 50%. Mm -hmm. um, to tie into what Martha said, weather. Uh, it seems as if there's a huge increment in people from the Midwest. Ohio, Pennsylvania, uh, Indiana, uh, moving here. They've been hit so hard in the past few years with the weather. Um, Myrtle Beach has, wasn't this great this year, but it's been much better. It's much better than most where most of them live. And one of the other interesting things I think we probably all concur with as far as uh, pricing is that their price point is probably off by about 14% in respect to what it was in 06 and 07. And I think so much is that is probably so much of that is probably due to the fact that their prices at home have also diminished and lost some value as well. So they're looking at a more economical, a more sustainable lifestyle uh, here in the Grand Strand area. As far as marketing goes, obviously social media is huge. Websites, the now and has been. Are there some strategies that any of you seem to use to really get? you know, a good lead on the client. What seems to have been successful, whether it's a website or some kind of an electronic uh, push or pull, as it may be? I always think marketing the actual property will capture the most accurate buyer, because that's truly what you're looking, they're looking for. So if you really push that out into social media mediums, then um, I really think that's the best way to capture that. So it's a little bit, Pushing the your product, yes, that the listing. actual product versus the beach versus the agent, you know. And that's interesting because the draw is the lifestyle, <coughs> the beach, the affordability. But you feel like at the end of the day, it's, it's a house, it's a property that you're living exactly. in. Exactly, and the other features, you know, around surrounded by that, just push them hopefully to move a little faster. Yeah. Do any of you get any feedback from the website per se, or as far as the clients that you do get? Do you keep track of how, how they came in? Was it, oh, I saw your website, or I, I, I referral through a friend, or do you monitor that? One, one thing that I do on, on the websites, and you know, there's two parts of, uh, of that I think are variables with the collecting leads on websites. Number one, you got lead generation, right? You just want to capture a lead. But then the thing that I really like to look at is how long are they staying on a website? You know, are they staying for six minutes? Are they staying for 10 minutes? Or are they actually staying only for two minutes? So the, the key with, as I found with websites, is you've got to bring them in on a, on a property. You know, you kind of tease them with the property, but when they get there, there's so many properties, you're going to actually hold them because you're educating them. You're giving them value. So there, to, to me, what I look at in the website is how much time are they staying on the website? And that, to me, is an indication as to whether or not they see value. So capturing the lead becomes simple nowadays. It's so easy to capture an email address a telephone number, but to convert it is difficult. And to convert it, we got to educate them. So I think that's the best strategy for the websites. And not educating them necessarily on the property, but educating them on other things like what are estimated closing costs, you know, or what are the taxes in this particular area, when are taxes paid in this particular county, things like that. Hmm. That's interesting. And that maybe sets us apart as well because they're used to a high tax in the Northeast and they're realizing, oh, property taxes are affordable at my vacation home. Sure, yeah, there's a lot of things we have to brag about. You know, and the key is is just making sure that we deliver the message in a way that the consumer finds, finds value. Yeah. If I'm a guy and if I'm in Ohio or Pennsylvania or Indiana, New York, looking for property, something's got to draw me here. We've listed some of it, but what, what separates where are they looking? I guess where are they, where is, in what group is Myrtle Beach included? Is it Florida? Is that our competition, if you will? Other South Carolina beaches, North Carolina? Where Not are they as looking? much as you would think it would be. Um, you know, people who are looking at Florida are specifically looking for Florida, and people who are looking for North and South Carolina are looking here. Now, some of them go down to Florida, and it's not exactly what they had pictured when they come back up, uh, as I was speaking earlier about the half -backs. but. Very rarely in the 30 years I've been in the business here, 
I very rarely hear, you know, I'm looking at the Carolinas or Florida. I mean, obviously it happens, but not, not that often, believe it or not. I hear Hilton Head, you know. <laughs> yeah, I hear that. more so Hilton Head. Yeah, yeah exactly. Head, you know, maybe up in North Carolina, the Outer Banks, but still not too much. Mostly Hilton Head, that's what I've right. experienced. Yeah, we have a real estate site called Think Myrtle Beach, and we ask, we always survey the uh, users that are on that site. And besides the Greater Myrtle Beach area, uh, number two we run up against is Charleston, then Hilton Head, then the other banks. So we match up exactly what you're all discussing here. I think the majority of people now are seeing this area with what it offers and the amenities that it offers and the location that it offers geographically. And it really comes down to value. I mean, a couple of people have said it, but if you, you're hard pressed to look up and down the eastern seaboard and find anything where you can get what you can get here for the value and the cost of it. Absolutely. Are there, uh, is there some way that, that the, the Board of Realtors, the Chamber, and Realtors can partner? Is there, are there tools that you all have that the Realtors can take advantage of that maybe they don't know about right now, trying to connect you guys? Is there something? I don't know the answer. Well, I think that's something we definitely can uh, collaborate on. You know, with the, the Chamber and the VisitMyrtleBeach.com site, and and now uh, the extension for the real estate market that, that we're leading, the thinkmyrtlebeach.com. You know, our first job is really top of funnel. Inspiration, get people interested in our destination for all the different things that we already previously talked about. And then from that point, just like we do on the tourism side, our job is to get them interested, but then to get them out to the people in the community that can book that hotel room, service them with an attraction, um, you know, help plan where they're gonna go to um, you know, to, to, to dine each night. And so the same principle can apply is that we get them interested in all the right reasons to either retire, relocate, or invest here, and then get them out to this community uh, seamlessly and easily so that they can do the conversion and the selling. That's not what the Chamber's in business for. We want to help convert sales, but we need to be at the top of the funnel and then pass them off to the people that do it well. <coughs> And the, the association of realtors function is very much like the chamber. We are not to convert sales. Our, our main goal is to provide tools and resources for the realtors and be an information source for the, for the consumer. Um, we do provide several things that I think uh, are, are beneficial to the chamber as well as our realtor members, our market statistics that we provide. Um, on a monthly basis. We also make a, a, a version of those statistics available to the consumer uh, that's on our website. And then one of the newest things that we're working on right now is an open house app that we're partnering with the local chambers to be able to, to provide information to consumers when they come visit the area that they might they, you know, it's raining today, or I've had enough sun, or enough of the beach, or enough golf, and this this app that I, I just learned about will be a good opportunity for me just to kind of ride around and learn more about the area, because I, I believe the statistics that, that I've, I've seen are our visitors come three or four times, and it takes a while to convert them, but the app will be something they can take home with them, continue to learn, and, and research the community and it's a driver it's just another tool that our realtors can use to um, in, in their toolbox in, in helping people um, find out about the great quality of life that we hear uh, have here on the grand strand sounds like a great app is that something that's uh, going to be big mm -hmm. yeah, you got to convince realtors then to do open houses <laughs> <laughs> for you to advertise, but it, you, it's not a quick medium. And if you are, are planning an open house on Saturday, and Saturday is going to be beautiful, but you see that maybe Friday after, or, you know, Friday is going to be a rainy day, wow, you can upload it to the app, it's real time, and you can capture those people. Um, if somebody's coming in on a Saturday for a week, and they type in what their parameters are, boom, they, can, they have that access immediately and you don't have to worry about oh wow this my window of opportunity with this the the print deadline was this or that so um we just felt like it was another opportunity that, that we could provide the realtors um for for free 
that um, you know you could use then at your disposal and, and um, you know we, we obviously know that there are going to be some challenges but we also think that there are going to be some growth opportunities with it um, as, as we roll it out and as our members uh, learn about it and the chambers have been very gracious since they are particularly a, 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 a point of, of interest and, and you know on the front end of people coming in asking about the community that the chambers are, are going to be able to partner with us and, and help us roll it out and get that information in the consumer's hands. I think it's a fabulous tool. I mean, I really do. And I think if we are either one of the first or the first board to, to get this app, is that correct? Yeah. We're actually having it developed. We're working with um, Cowork NYR, a couple of folks through there, and they have been extremely helpful in, in just helping us realize from, from a development standpoint of what a consumer, because they're not in the real estate business, they don't look through the same lens that we do, they've kind of helped us from a consumer standpoint of what would be of interest, and what things should you consider putting on there? So, um, I, I think the I think the community is going to be pleased. It's just going to be a a, a a challenge for us to to get it in everybody's hands and and, be, and, and kind of figure out how it's being used and, and what the met, metrics are once it's being used, and, and that we're going to have to rely on the realtor community to, to give us that feedback. And I guess the question I might have is, how will a visitor know it exists? Well, app itself. Two, two, twofold. We, we're doing. We're going to have a, a rollout plan. Um, but first, first and foremost, we're working with the chambers um, all along the Grand Strand area in Orion, Georgetown County, and uh, they're going to they're going to have it to to distribute the um, the app for people to download. Realtors are going to have it uh, to provide their uh, clients when they're coming in, as well as we're going to do some marketing. We're going to do. Um, in area marketing, and we're also going to try to do some out of area marketing. What's the timeline? We want to capture uh, the 100 days of summer, so we are in a big push to try to have it ready by the end of this month. Since we're on the open house, maybe I'll just ask agent, agent, professional here. How has your open house experiences been now that the market, you know, deals are a little more plentiful? Are you doing more? Can I open that up for feedback? As a proponent of open houses, uh, I certainly believe in them. I have more than one sale that I can directly attribute to the open house. And there's a lot of people out here that want to move here. They're visiting. Mm -hmm. And it is that thing you're sitting around and going, well, you know what? I don't know what's out here. Let me go drive around. All of a sudden, they walk in a house and go, so how much is it? And you talk about the taxes. You talk about the other things we have. And they're like, wow, I guess I really can afford to live here. Maybe I don't want to keep running that hotel, which is not maybe the best thing. but. At the same time, they're coming down, they're going to buy, and they're going to bring the family because more family comes down, and it just sort of snowballs. So <coughs> our experience is positive, and sometimes they're slow, sometimes they're busy, uh, but all in all, generally, open houses still very much work for us. I agree 100%, because I, I, I really attribute a lot of my business to meeting people at an open house, because you are face-to-face, -face, you get to meet them, you shake their hand, all the websites in the world can give all kinds of information, but it's that face-to-face -face handshake that, you know, you meet somebody and you have a connection, and I have a lot of, a lot of my business is from open houses. Uh, across the country, open houses is a trendy, it's trending up, and, and the, um, the driver of that is the fact that the internet provides so much information to the consumer now. And so the open house just gives the consumer that one extra bit of power where they can actually do make their own decisions. So they're looking at the house on the internet, they're reading about the house and all the, the amenities of the community, all the specifics of the HOA on the internet. So they've got all that information. They don't need to call the realtor because they've got all that information. And now that they see that they can actually now go on a tour of, of the homes that they choose without calling a realtor again. So now they can take from looking at a property to learning about a property to viewing a property, and in their mind, they've never had to reach out to a realtor. So it's just the extra step that, that the consumer starts to feel like we're in control. So what we're seeing in the real estate industry with realtors is the open houses be, are becoming another tool for lead capture. So it's, a, it's an upward trend right now. You're gonna see more and more of it across the country. A lot of realtors are gonna be thinking very positively about open houses. I also don't mind that the neighbors don't come in, you know, and they do. Uh, I just think it's great because the neighbors do have friends and family and they do come in and, and they will, other people do move down. So I encourage that. 
I hold about two uh, open houses a month, sometimes three, um, if I can get somebody else to do one for me. But I think my sellers also appreciate the open house, and then I capture, you know, possible buyers or neighbors who have friends who are looking, and it just it puts the house out there for people to feel more comfortable just to walk in without having to to um, <coughs> hook up with a real estate agent, you know, or make a commitment to someone because they're just trying to gather information. And, um, you know, it, it also puts my name back out there on the, in the paper or on an app or um, in front of people again. And it puts the house out in another area of the internet and in the paper again. So um, I, I, I love doing open houses. Well, if this app, that when the app is started and takes off, I could see people doing more open houses to get on that good tool. And I've, had, I've actually had a couple of sales just as just these past three months. I, mean, I had one client follow me into the open houses. I'm setting it up. <clears throat> Two days later, I was writing the offer, listed their property, got more listings from that. And just the other day, I wrote an offer up last night on the property. I held up in Sunday that people walked in. We connected up. So real estate is very much a people business. And as that connection that Martha's talking about, you know, we can talk and talk and talk on the phone and get along, but really until you meet them and, and shake their hand and say, this is me and this is you and we can work it out, that's how you really can get those sales happening in the future. So have you trend the day of the week and time frame, one to three, 12 to two for traffic? For me, I'm a one to four Sunday afternoons. I know Sundays are not necessarily the best thing, but I take off in the middle of the week if I need to. I'm but you're oh, twelve to three. I try to wait till after church mm -hmm. gets out. And they're in their clothes, and then I have found that I've, I'm working in the general real estate as well as pods, which is planning and developments. I mean, it's a hit and miss. I mean, you can have ten people walk in to a model on a Tuesday and none on a Saturday. I mean, it really is a hit and miss. A lot, a lot of a lot of sales professionals, they want to have it on the weekends, which in the summertime, that's good. But, you know, basically when it's not summer, I mean, uh, during the week, it's just as good as the weekends. It really is. If there's a model home in the community where I have a listing, I would pop up a sign. Right. And on a Tuesday, take my computer over there and I'll work from right there and hopefully draw traffic off of their advertising. But if there is a model home in that community and I've got a listing in there, I'm going to go over there and work Absolutely. for a couple yeah. hours. Mm -hmm. and, and lots of times I'll do just one to three or at that two hours because I find that oh, that's really all you need is two hours. I can stay there if I get there at 12. Usually it's 12, 30, 4 to 1 before anybody starts coming in. And, and pretty much if I'm going to stay at 4, they cut off like right at 3, 3, 15. So two hours usually works best. And, you know, it's just a relaxed atmosphere. You know, they feel comfortable walking in. And you're more relaxed. Um, it's just a more relaxed atmosphere. They feel like they can just carry on conversation with you. And, you know, I, I get a lot out of it. One thing that's difficult during the week has really to do with the municipalities and the inability to place signs. So that's really what hinders my ability to hold up a house. One nice thing about the app, um, and, and that sort of is, is the reason that, that the whole concept came together, uh, was because of the sign ordinance. And, and the beautiful thing about the app is people will be able to um, use the GPS on their phone to get to the apps. They don't have to know the neighborhoods or where they're going. So it's it's really another opportunity for people to learn about our community while we do have things like sign ordinances that, that create barriers for the consumer to find open house. I think it'd be wonderful. Yeah, definitely. Um, well, but yeah, I'm going to say it's going to be the as far as uh, research, kind of jumping back to the markets that you reach out to. For the chamber, I mean, six years ago before I moved here in Cincinnati, Ohio, I saw an ad from Myrtle Beach, and I thought, wow, that looks great. What goes into to deciding or deciphering, hey, we're gonna, har we're gonna harbor this market, we're gonna hit Cincinnati or Akron or, or Louisiana. Do you know what goes into that research that, that could maybe help some of us here today to understand, oh, maybe we should be targeting these markets? 
Yeah, there's a lot, a lot of different sources that we look at. Um, a lot of times we'll get visitor inquiries um, through different means. And we'll utilize those to uh, evaluate if that's a market potential for us. Keep in mind that over the last couple of years, we've done a lot with publicity and earned media, getting coverage in newspapers and television shows that we wouldn't otherwise pay for. And I was sharing with, with Greg earlier that in the last couple of years, we've had a lot of national exposure for our publicity efforts. And what we'll do is we'll watch on our website and we'll see if some of those markets that we don't actively target with our advertising, we'll start to see where is the uplift and in interest coming back to our website. And if we start to see um, several months of increased activity without actually placing advertising in that market, we'll start to put advertising in that market and grow it even further. When we were talking, we used uh, Los Angeles a couple years ago as uh, one of our test markets. And we started seeing a significant growth in utilization of our website from California. I started seeing people when I traveled, and it was interesting, he had mentioned to me, he started seeing interest in real estate even from people from California. So that's just sort of one example of that. But typically, um, as our budget has afforded us the opportunity to go beyond those states, we continue to really look at what goes on with our hotel community first and foremost. They have access to all the zip code data. And so what we'll do is we'll work with them and in aggregate, they'll share that data with us. This is another means by which we do this. And we start to look at where are the markets and we'll ask them, what, what's trending for you? You know, and sometimes it's a direct result of our collaborative efforts of marketing the community. Other times, um, we'll go out into those markets that they typically won't go into because, you know, there are very close, a lot of them are close range uh, marketers from that close drive radius. Uh, and so that allows us the opportunity to go beyond those borders and really try to stimulate those other markets. So, to kind of circum circle back to your question, there's a lot of different types of sources that, that we look at in order to expand our marketing. Is it realistic to think come for vacation, stay for retirement type thing? I mean, are you realtors hearing or seeing things where people are saying, yeah, we, we took, we were the halfbacks, we're going back up northeast, and uh, well, we came for a week's vacation and we loved it. Is that the typical client, or is that kind of an anomaly and it's really more people that have been thinking about Burbank for a long time? That's been the problem. I think sometimes it's people that have already had an experience here. I mean, um, a lot of people say, oh, I, and I did the same thing. I came here as a kid. My parents brought me. I, I vacationed here when I was young. I came and played golf when I was younger or whatever. And they just they have memories that bring them back here. Um, I have a lot of that. I came on vacation 29 years ago, and I'm, I never left. So <laughs> I'm exactly that. And um, over the years, being in real estate for this long, just about that long, um, that's what I've seen is people that have come down, they come down, they come down, and they are just over the weather up north, and they are going to retire down here. And then on top of it, our lifestyle as far as the affordability is just amazing. Where else can we possibly go to get what we have? Do you see a hard winter like we had up north? Does that translate? Directly to us. I've had more people this year say, I'm finished, I'm done, it's yeah. over, we're moving. And, and they may not have yet been in that place where they were ready to pull the trigger and move, but they're tired of that. Actually, I spoke to a couple of real estate agents who were thinking about doing the same thing. So <laughs> it's been a challenging winter. One other thing that I think this area is going to see. Uh, particularly tied to economic development. Um, Horry County has done a great job over the past few years in diversifying their economy, not solely reliant on um, tourism. What, when when the, the economy got so tough, the tourists didn't have the money to come, and I think that really gave us an opportunity to look at what other opportunities are out there. And uh, the, the EDC has done a really good job and will continue to do a good job of, of bringing in those companies of people that might have vacationed here that are, are interested in, in the quality of life that we have. And, and um, there's a lot of lot of uh, interest in the Myrtle Beach, Horry County area. And that will be another source of business for, for the, the uh, realtor community. Touching on that, with some of this data you and I were talking about the other day, I found very interesting. The Chamber does a fantastic job as well as the board. But for us in our industry, we're not always specifically tied to what they're doing and what they're promoting because I found it so interesting in the, the report that the Brandon Group did that 
golf does not rank in the top 10 requests of things that they're looking for in a place they move to. And for our community and our economy, we hope they never stop promoting golf from a touristic perspective. For, but from me deciding to want to come and live here, golf is not in the top 10 request of things that they would like to see and they would like to participate in when they move here. So I thought that was very interesting. Let me ask a question, uh, different subject. You mentioned some. You, you mentioned the diversity of product. Building, new construction has picked up, obviously, uh, over it was over when it was non-existent a few years ago. Does that? What does the new construction piece add to product diversity? Is that something that is attractive to these distant buyers? I think one of the things that I find, right, especially people coming from the Northeast, is they want they don't want anything that's old. They're coming from older homes. They're coming from older subdivisions. And so they'll say to me, well, it can't be no more than five years old. A lot of our stuff isn't that old. You know, it's really, you can get into older sections, obviously, but a lot of it is, is relatively new. So as the new construction starts up again, um, they'll, that product, I think, if people say, I just want new. I just want new. I want to st I'm starting over in a new place, and I want new. I lose a lot of sales to new construction. I sell a lot of new construction also, but I lose a, on, on my resales on, if an agent is showing one of my listings, usually they're looking at going back and forth between do I buy this, an existing home, or do I have time to build, you know, do I want to build, um, and they've made it so easy because a lot of these national builders are coming in and putting up 14, 15, 16, 17 homes at a time and just running through these communities really quick. So. The availability of an existing home or a spec home, as they call it, is is you know easy. They can walk in and see it, and, and um, I think people the models are just blown out and they're beautiful, and they can touch it and feel it and go, oh, I want to live like this. And and then if you have a resale, um, they don't want to do any updating. They don't want to have to take down wallpaper. They don't want to have to update the bathrooms, and they just don't want to do that so if you put a home on the market that's a resale it better come right on the market you know looking pretty good or because your direct competition is going to be that new construction I just, think it, um, I just think new construction right now compared to home six you have a healthier buyer it's an end use buyer versus an investor that's just going to hold it for one year and sell so I think that is very positive for our marketplace number two I think it's just great because you can clearly walk into a 2006 built home and of 2014 and, and know the age of the homes. So how the needs have changed of what people are looking for, you know, um, a level island, you know, just little traits that you didn't see in 06. So it is healthy for our marketplace to bring in that fresh product of what the trend is today and it, it will draw more people to maybe move quicker in their, you know, dream location. You mentioned resellers and not wanting to fix things up and, and do that, but for people in our community who are saying, I'm having trouble selling my house, I'm putting floors and I'm putting countertops, is that significantly much more important than getting it listed right away? I mean, it's almost better to not have it on listed so long and do those things if you can afford to live there while you're doing them. So I guess, would you put an exclamation mark, all of you on, for people that are looking to sell or home out there to some of these out of towners of, got to get it modernized, you got to make it stay apart or at least blend in with the contemporary market, right? Uh, I do. I mean, when I go in, the first thing I do is I walk around as if I'm a buyer and I look at, is there a lot of clutter? You know, you're packing up anyway, so pack it up and get it out and clean up and clean it. Um, you want them to come in, you want a fresh look, um, a clean look. You don't want them to be distracted by all the stuff that some people have in their homes. Uh, wallpaper. I mean, if if that if it's affordable to that seller to do it, then I'm going to suggest that they do it before it goes on the market. And and I typically like to give them a timeline to do the, you know, how soon can you get this done? You know, let's get it done. We'll fill out the paperwork for the listing. Here's your timeline. We'll put it on the market when this is complete. When this is complete, I'll come and take the the photos. And it it typically makes a huge difference. I feel this year more than any, when I go into a listing appointment, I usually 
80% in time would sign up that day. But I'm probably down to 50% where there's a list of things to do and I usually have to revisit them in two to three weeks. So my lag time of getting homes on the market has been delayed. With the late spring market, it's actually worked to our favor, but it's easier for me to get them to do those things because the price point has increased based on the, the market being healthier. And then we compete a little more head on and so far it's worked. And I think um, waiting to put it on MLS is really important until they're ready because when we first list, it goes out to so many people that we have automatic notifications set up. So you want those pictures to hit really nicely. And uh, I, I just listed a house this past week, but I went in exactly like what you're talking about, gave a lot of suggestions. They ha they've had it listed before. I asked, you know, what is your feedback? Well, it's dark. That's what, it, that's what they kept hearing. I said, your house really is not dark, but you need a glass front door in front of your door. So I sent them to Lowe's yesterday. They're sending me all these pictures on my phone. Sent them to, um, and they have a lot of print. I said, you need to roll this rug up. We need to neutralize so that, so that this can be appealing to everyone. And so anyways, they were working yesterday. Sending me all these pictures. And I'm like, that looks fresh. That looks great. And uh, so I'm excited about going back in, helping them rearrange, and getting those pictures fresh and back in MLS with a new listing and I believe that we're going to sell that house even at a higher dollar value than where they were listed before because mainly because it's going to be bright and light in there. Fresh feel. I think a lot of um, <laughs> sellers too, I hear this all the time, do you watch Property Brothers? Do you watch HGTV? They say that same thing all the time so they're more in tune to what we're talking about and what's ne what needs to be done to get their home um, merchandise or staged correctly and and come out um, you know ready for that buyer to walk into the door and not walk in the door and go oh my gosh this house just needs too much dog done to it you know and I, but I really think you know they are, they do they watch these TV shows and so it's it's um, made them you know more aware of what needs to be done and more open to making those changes that that you're asking for they understand to Janice's point too, right now I think the buyers are, there's an opportunity now that over the last few years everything's been so price driven that now if you've got a home that, that offers everything that they're looking for and is the HGTV, the model home feel when they walk in, their buyers are willing to pay a fair price for it. And so sellers have got an opportunity to actually, if they want to maximize what they're going to get out of that, then that's the way to do it versus, you know, just, um, just being so so price driven. So. Yeah. Also, to Janice's point, um, seeing those types of shows certainly prepares them to hear that criticism. But I think that a lot of them forget um, that all real estate is local. So they really, before they're ready to actually list and sell the home, they need to start consulting with a professional, a real estate professional, months in advance, rather than trying to do the work themselves or watch the TV show and then mimic exactly what they saw. Bring someone in ahead of time because. You know, we're seeing sometimes people think they've done everything correctly, and you know because they've watched these shows and they walk in and you walk in the listening appointment and it's you know you have other suggestions than <laughs> 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 what they chose to go with. So consult with a professional ahead of time. I spend hours sometimes at people's homes redoing furniture and taking things down and getting them all involved before I even do listing paperwork. Sometimes so I'm definitely before I take these photos trying to make the home you know, more marketable and you know, merchandise it a little bit better than what they sometimes think that it looks really something. Sometimes things look really good to to them, but it's just, um, you know, some of the patterns and it's just too much or you know, flower couches and, and plaid rugs. You know, some, you just have to roll them up and put them in a closet. Let me write that down. Flower counting. <laughs> <laughs> They're definitely gone. And when they tell you they watch the show, you have to remind them that it doesn't happen, the renovation overnight. <laughs> <laughs> it's the longer, the more investment time. That's why they get excited, you know, because they feel like they're being a part of it. And, and they really, they have to be. You're, once they sign that paper, they're a team. Yeah. And, you know, I'm, I'm not working against them. I'm working with them, and I need them to be on the same page. So. Um, as far as the deals out there, people come here for value, obviously. 
um, the REOs, the real estate owned, the, the short sales. Do you sense there are many left out there overall, or are they pretty much, from what you're seeing, scarce to none? Scarce to none. Scarce to none is a big word. Uh, yeah, a big yeah. couple yeah. words. Uh, <laughs> diminished significantly in our marketplace. Yeah. 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 It's surely not on the top of our minds, I don't no, think, or at least no, myself. No, I, don't, mm -hmm. I, just, I hadn't heard that word in a little while. <laughs> and do you feel then overall that's one of the reasons that you all could be losing sales is because people are coming here with that mindset of, oh wait, where are the REOs and the short sales that we think we can bargain from? Does that impact your bottom line, the lack of those? I don't know that it's the lack of them. I think people, there are people that uh, will call and they'll say, well, I'm, I'm here to steal something. Mm. Really? Still, they're still doing it. Really? Probably Every once in a while, yeah, you'll get that. Uh, I'm here to steal something, and my thought is, well, where were you in 2009 and 10? Right. Because that's when you could have stolen something, so to speak, but you're probably not doing that anymore. I think so. it's really press-driven. You know, the press is not pressing, you know, and announcing, you know, foreclosure short sales is such a front-of-mind issue in today's marketplace. So we're now talking about price appreciation, you know, new construction. There's other focus. So where their minds are, where they're presented is where their minds will go. So I actually rarely get calls, you know, for that type of buyer today. And what role do you hope the media can play besides saying, go to all of your firms and buy a house? Uh, <laughs> Do you feel like the media in general, whether it's local or national, misses the boat a little bit by honing in on the deals, which, sure, they were kind of there in 09 or 10. Is there any kind of a general consensus you might have on what role the media can play that could give people an accurate assessment of property along the Grand Strand? The media could give people an accurate assessment. Uh, that's, that's a lot. Um, I've never been a big believer in the fact that uh, Good news sells newspapers usually it's the contrary bad news sells newspapers they usually tend to hone in on things that aren't so optimistic and positive uh, just the fact that today i think the uh with the way the economy is looking uh with the way our marketplace is looking uh they the, the media today seems to be fairly neutral and semi-positive in regards to all activity i think that's a good thing because i think the people that we're, we're dealing with people we see in the marketplace today seem to be comfortable uh, and they seem to feel optimistic about investing uh, their pensions and coming to live in this area or somewhere else. They don't, they're not bombarded by this negativity on a day-to-day -day basis like we've had in the past past years. So, uh, and that's already a great thing. I, I think like from 2009, 2010, it was just everything was national news. But we are just such a unique market. So. I think the greatest thing they could do is really report, you know, if it's national, great, make sure it's expressed national. But if it's Grand Strand, it's it's different. And it's because we are a niche, we have a different buyer profile. We have so many, you know, less industry, if you will. So there's so many different variables. And I just felt like we were getting caught up in the national when we were very different. So I would just say, you know, <laughs> In reporting that, I would express how local, the local whatever you're numbers. reporting <clears throat> exactly, exactly. and really focus on that. People want to. And, and Laura's good when you come in and we talk about kind of some of the trends in sales, but me being isolated from what you all do, I'm always curious does it help the home buyers when we say, hey, sales were down 8% last February? It hates the reality, we try to report what's real, but. What's the rub on when we say sales are up? Do you feel like you get more calls? People are like, oh, that's the trend. I got to buy a house. Sales are a little bit down in February. Well, this business, maybe there are better deals out there. I mean, what would be an impact for you in our reporting of the facts, still being as truthful and honest as we can be, of course? But is there, is there a way that we can cover this story and still bring a benefit to you in a fair light? I think getting the point across that, you know, if you don't buy now, if you wait for a year or two or three, I mean, there's no telling what the prices are going to be. I mean, we're definitely in an upswing market. So uh, buying now is, as always, or at least now, mm -hmm. uh, the best way to go. I think with, with um, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be really difficult with as much exposure and as many 
different sources that people go to for their information, it's going to be nearly impossible to ever have a consistent message, right? Yeah. So that actually, the way I look at it, is it actually works as a professional in the business. It, it works in my favor because that confusion causes a need for education, and it causes a need for somebody to reach out and say, "Help me interpret what all of this stuff means." And you know, if everybody had a a hundred percent clear picture from what they were getting online in different places, then you know a lot of my value is probably going to be diminished because that's that's what I see my job. Well, I kind of I kind of look at it as the media uh, are are partners with with us. Um, what what is going on in the community certainly needs to be reported accurately, but um, making sure that that what's going on on a national level. It is boiled down or translated to what's going on on our level, because when 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 times are good, people want to be a part of the good times, and that that's good for all of us. But when times are, are difficult, um, focusing on on what what reality is, and not trying to to make things appear worse than they are, because then that is that's negative for everybody. Um, I just I kind of see it as a partnership, but I think Brendan's right that um, you're never going to get a consistent message. But uh, it's it's very important that, that on a local level that, that we stay focused on uh, who we are, what we are, what we have to offer, the quality of life, and the better aspects, but the reality of, of what the market is. And you can also look at some of the things that have happened um, in the beginning of the year. While we are in a, in a <coughs> much better market than we've been, the first couple of months of the year, sales were down. Well. If you're trying to compare why sales were down this year versus last year, um, you know, let, let's look at the weather. Let's look at things that, that impacted the sales instead of, you know, it, it, is it, you know, something, some other factor that we haven't haven't really considered. So I, I think it's real important to make sure that that we look dig a little bit deeper into to what is causing the the, um, the decline or maybe a a, a dip. Well, I'd invite all of you not to go off too much on a tangent, but you know, news is key and information is key, and, and we're only as good as our source, really, when we put things on the air, whether it's print or TV. So, uh, and Roy's been great as well, too, about coming in and trying to have simplify it in terms that the viewer understands. Our biggest challenge is taking a really complex situation and putting it into 30 seconds, which, as you know, isn't easy when you're trying to sell a house or sell a story. So I would invite all of you at any time, email, call, whatever, to if you see something out there seems really strange or off, whether it's the national trend that went to the local trend and we picked it up and didn't get enough chance to, to proofread it, let us know. You know, let us know what you're seeing. Give us a call, shoot us an email, give us that. Because we need your feedback when we're trying to cover what the market's doing. And what I'll do to that point is to make sure you have after today uh, Michael's email address so you can send ideas as I progress. Yeah, should have asked that first before <laughs> you've seen it anyway. Yeah, so that's great. Um, what do you feel like, um, what's the common denominator that you feel all of you could benefit from here today? And, and is there a topic that we need to kind of delve into that would help everyone? The, the Chamber of Research is interesting to me, but also interesting that uh, golf wasn't in the top 10. Is that what we heard for, for people that are buying homes? So, is there information that you can share here that we haven't even kind of tapped into yet? The app is great. Research is key and informative. Um, maybe some of your struggles individually of, of just an issue that comes up that you feel like camaraderie could help? Because it's, it's fascinating to me to have all of your brains in here. As a journalist, I want to ask everybody so many questions. But, but what would help you folks today in um, an issue that's, that you're dealing with, a constant issue? Uh, or Anything like that, or we something go around the table and, and, and say, "What's your biggest lead generator?" I mean, that's interesting. Yeah. What, what's, yeah. Yeah. It wouldn't have to necessarily be negative. What's what's the, the positive? What, what works well? I thought it was interesting that you said how long people are on the website, and I was going to ask, does that correlate then maybe to a sale or lead if they're on for ten minutes? Uh, and also, how do you track that? I don't know that everybody knows how to track the users on the website. That's interesting to me, but. Whoever wants to chime in about what works well for generating leads and mine is my leads are pretty much I'm about 92, 93 percent referral. So I work my um, past buyers and sellers. Um, I keep up with them. I like to be their source of information. 
three years down the road if they want to put in paint their house you know who did who do they use so um i keep in touch with all my past buyers and sellers and that tends to work for me um, a good way those relationships establishing and continuing i agree it's the same it's the same in my in my business it's it's friends of friends that then refer other people and and keeping in touch with them is is key because I think that I remember years ago when we were in New Jersey and we had bought a house from a certain realtor and we were getting ready to sell it. I never heard from her again. I might have used her, yeah. but I never heard from her in the five years we lived in that house. So it, 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 the key is just keeping in touch with people. My, uh, my sphere of influence, of, um, Mandy actually helped me really look at what is my sphere of influence. And so I've been here for 29 years. So. And uh, so anyways, take a good look at that, work that sphere of influence where people know me and trust me and I have relationships and then um, also referrals. And referrals are uh, everything, really. The, the company owners here, what is, what is your biggest job? Mine is signs, calls off the signs. I mean, that, that's where I get, as a company, that's where I get most of, most of my leads from is, is, is calling for the sign. I know you're yeah. really heavy on the internet and you do a lot of stuff and SEOs and stuff. So for, for, for buyers, there's no question we, we, we were early adopters of search off you know engine optimization. Right. We jumped on that quick instead of getting involved with the Zillows and the Trulias and, and buying the leads, we, we decided to invest heavily on the front end. And you know, so we are generating hundreds of, of buyer leads on a weekly basis. So that's on the buying side, that's definitely the biggest generator, and then on the, the selling listing side, it's prospecting. And um, but with prospecting, it's then you know building databases and then nurturing them over time, educating and trying to empower the consumer, you know, with information so they can make you know sound business decisions when it comes to selling the property. So we get a tremendous amount of uh, return off of that. We'll, we'll, we'll nurture. We'll nurture a, a potential seller for five or six years. Right. You know, we'll nurture them and educate them for years and until they convert. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. So is that a typical return on investment? Is not typical, but is that a common situation that you might invest three to five years on a prospective yeah. seller, buyers? And buyers and sellers. And sellers. Mm -hmm. Wow. That's amazing. The seller that side is definitely a sphere of influence type thing, I think, in that referral business, but back to Greg, it's that internet that does drive a lot of those buyers, whether it is one of the other websites that gets you yeah. that lead because of your listings. I think most of us can also benefit from that. that we just have to be heavy on the internet and the biggest thing is getting back to the people. Yeah. And as long as you can make that connection, uh, you can usually end up getting a sale from that, but you just have to kind of stay with that lead and not just let it fall by the wayside, which Right now, I think a lot of us are very, very busy, and there's probably more than one lead that we aren't able to get back to right away. But it, it's it's a it's a good thing that's going on right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I still do a lot of uh, direct mail postcards uh, for them. You know, it's a little more old school, but it still works to bring you in the email marketing and trying to do a little bit of it all together. Um, so I still do some direct marketing that I get a good response from. Time response is very important. You know, that's human nature, especially with the internet and everything out there. I mean, quick response is very, very important. Us as humans, we want instant gratification. And if we don't get it there, we're going to go here. So that's, that's very important on getting back. I think there's a, a balance, too, that we've got to, that we're all experiencing as technology has become so prevalent to not rely entirely on technology um, because if you, if you make sure you know how that lead wants to be communicated with, technology might be perfect for them. But when you're texting a lead back because they want to, that's different than you know just responding to your leads through email. You at some point have to pick up the phone and have a conversation with them to make that connection. Mm -hmm. So I think that there's a there's a danger in letting technology kind of take over your business for the convenience of it and actually missing the connection. It would seem that more the the out of towners, you would need that internet connection first and foremost because it's it's more convenient to hop online. But I also heard you talk about the importance of the open house. So if you're looking at out-of-town prospective buyers, how do you kind of balance that? You kind of initiate the process and that communication online and then remind them when they're here on vacation or if they're passing by that there's an open house? Or do you feel like 
with the trends of out-of-towners and technology, that can almost be enough to seal prospective deal that people see it online or not. We're not gonna get down there until July or August, but when we get down there, we're ready to go. What sort of trends do you see when we're talking about out-of-towners who need the technology just to get the exposure to the house initially? But the, the key is, I mean, the reality is, is there's, we all have the same buyers in our databases. I mean, my, my buyers are in, is, are your buyers. Mm -hmm. Same with Mandy and, and all of us. So, you know, I, I think w what, what the internet does is that, you know, that, that buyer in, in New York or New Jersey, they're going on to multiple websites. They're signing up for multiple websites. They're getting alerts from multiple websites. Um, unfortunately, you know, or, or fortunately for those of us that are, you know, a little bit more active, most realtors are not following up with those leads. So, what it, you know, you get this person that comes in a year ago and, and gets onto the website. Um, what most realtors, or a lot of times what happens is the realtor will call them and find out they're a year out and then they forget about them. Okay, because they don't have enough time to nurture that person for a year. So that's where automation comes back in. That's where email communication, if you can think out your, your sequences and your campaigns properly, then you can actually communicate with that buyer in a, through automation, but they actually feel like you're, it's a one-on-one -on -one communication. So there's a big difference in using tech, technology in a one-size-fits-all type of communication and using automation to facilitate a one-on-one -on -one conversation. So there's ways to do that. And then if you do that properly, then we'll understand when their time frame for coming down to Myrtle Beach is. Because remember, a lot of these people book a hotel. So when are they booking a hotel? Are they booking a hotel or a condo two months ahead of time? Well, at the same time that they're booking that hotel is when the realtor should be booking an appointment. Because now they booked a hotel, they know their, their, um, their arrival and their departure. So then that's when the, the agent can actually learn their arrival and departure and go ahead and pre-book. Mm -hmm. And so it's really the first person who books that appointment that is going to end up working with that buyer when they come down. So you've got to think of a, like a hoteler. Right. You know, you've got to say, when's your arrival date? When's your departure date? And if they keep saying, I don't know, then that means they probably have not booked their lodging yet. So once you figure out when they book their lodging, then you know you can book their showing appointment. Is the percentage of out-of-towners versus local buyers much different? Do you have kind of stats that show 80% of my clients are still the local buyers, the family, friends of the locals versus out-of-towners, or is, it, is there any kind of stat percentage that any of you have kind of run or looked at? I mean, uh -oh. you, can, you can look at the tax records and, and see that about 66% of the homes in Horry County are second homes. So I, I, I think that would be a good indicator, but their markets might be different. Do you, know, do you track that or is that important for you to track or not necessarily? You just kind of look at people are buying and buying. You, is it a concern to say, well, there are definitely more out of towners that are buying second homes? Or? I think that the way that the internet is kind of forced most agents to go more online, and I'm not saying local uh, people moving within the market <coughs> don't look at the internet. That's not the case. But I feel like you would, if I think at the end of the day, as agents, we have plenty of business. So the best thing I would recommend is focusing on your niche and branding your niche to be different. And then once you capture them at that point, um, you know, the education, the adding value to keep them is so critical throughout this process. But um, I, I will market differently to an in-town buyer than I will a northeast or west coast <coughs> buyer. So there's a different action plan depending on the conversation I have with them to distinguish time frame and their goals. And I used to hear the, the phrase, "There's two, Myrtle Beach has two markets, the ocean front and everything across the street. <laughs> is, that, is that still the case? And do, and do distant buyers come in with one or the other in mind? And does that get garbled once they get here? Do they change their mind? I think there's a few more markets than yeah. just those two. And um, because we are such a broad county and with the EDC really bringing in a tremendous amount of folks, um, you know, the rural Horry County is a very untapped marketplace, in my opinion, and um, it's an area of growth going into the next, I would say, one to four years because of the EDC's success of drawing those businesses. And I think it's interesting, too, because people may initially come here or they'll say, I want, a, I want an ocean, I want to be on the ocean front. I'm a, I want to retire on the ocean front. 
Okay, that's fine, but your neighbors change every week. It, there are very few people that live on the oceanfront in a condo. Homes, yes, obviously, and that's, a, that's another market. That's an entirely different market. But I think once they get here and they realize that living on the oceanfront is different than what their perspective was, because they don't understand that it's really a hotel atmosphere. Um, people change every week. The people, they just don't know that until they get here and, they, and then they, they realize what that is. And maybe that then changes their perspective as to where they want to go now. They go, oh, okay, now I get it. So it just depends. Yeah, I think that another way to look at it, I mean, we are segmented, you know, um, but I don't, I think we're segmented into primary, secondary, and investor. So if somebody is coming down here <coughs> to move into a primary home, then they're not the ones that go to the oceanfront condos and then, or, or go to, say, Carolina Forest and then get, say, well, let me check on oceanfront condos. So they don't get jumbled up in that because it's primary and, and, and they know that primary is not typically an oceanfront condo. Then you've got second homes. So second homes, you know, they're, they're very clear on, on what their intention is and then you got the investor. So I think that the, you, instead of it's oceanfront and then everything across the street, I think it's primary, secondary, and investor. And Greg, I think to add to that, you almost have subcategories too. Mm -hmm. You've got... Um, you know, we were talking about the distressed property market, and it, yes, it's substantially smaller than it was in past years, but you still have that, and that market has set a lot of people's expectations for today. And the fact is, those expectations are just not correct anymore. Um, we're, we're doing a lot of work with our agents to try on that initial conversation to educate them about the market, to have them educate their client about the market. Um, so that that client understands where we are in situations where we're seeing multiple offers on some properties, where we're seeing properties sell in a day or a week, and they're just not coming into this market expecting that. So um, there's those three, but then there's this dynamic as well, and it's really confusing if the expectations aren't set up front. Let me introduce uh, the gentleman sitting quietly in the corner. Steve Jones is here with the Sun News. I'm not going to ask you to make a speech, but I do want to, Steve is, is uh, going to feature this event, tomorrow's paper. I want you to have a chance to ask a question if we're missing something. I didn't really have any questions, but I just wanted to let all of y'all know when you're contacting somebody about something you see out there that might be news, you can contact me too. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll make sure that. Contact information gets to you as well. <laughs> Steve's always looking for a story. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> but we touched on the uh, the new construction area. That question actually came from Steve, and I want to make sure that we, if you want to flesh that out, fine. But uh, that's one of the points that we wanted to touch on in, in the story. There's so much just like this, like my understanding. So many people that come to our area, and that unless they come here for 29 years or moved here 29 years ago. So many people don't understand and know uh, our communities. Uh, for them, everything is Myrtle Beach. They don't know Little River and Surfside and Myrtle's Inlet, and it's different in each individual community. Carolina Forest, there's so much here, so many people think we're going to Myrtle Beach and it's all one place. It's not. And the diversity of, of a, and availability of properties and different lifestyles within each community is, is, is huge. Uh, so a great deal of our job is to educate them, is to, is to interpret their desires and needs and requests, and then to educate them on the various locations that are here and the availability is here, different type of lifestyle, not just property. Because the determination as to where they're gonna live and what type of property they're gonna have is gonna to determine to a big degree the type of lifestyle they're gonna have and what they're looking for. So it's, it's a lot of it is education, and we have so much here. Now you, I mean, you're, now we boils down to your job to get in the car. How do you, on, a, on day one, when their impression is, I, I want to see houses in Myrtle Beach, and they mean from Little River to Stillview. Start, 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 start asking you, questions yeah, because the first thing they do, right. they'll, they'll send you a list. <laughs> if someone sends you a list of ten properties <laughs> I want to see, they're going to start in Brunswick County, and then you're going to be in Georgetown County, yeah. and you got ten places to see. First thing is to do is start asking questions and limit. You got you got to narrow it down, funnel it down. To what exactly are they looking? Uh, sometimes you'll ask them to make me a list of the five things you can absolutely not live with for the rest of your life and the five things you never want to see again in your life. Uh, 
you have to pinpoint it, narrow it down exactly what their desires and needs are and what, what particular property they really are looking for uh, and the lifestyle they're looking for. Yeah, yeah, everything's on the internet. Most of the time they're coming here well educated. Mm -hmm. They know more than us sometimes about right. certain things. And um, they, they're giving us their list. And you know, hypothetical, we may add or compliment or present something else that they may like. But they are very astute buyers today. And I think too, when they come from out of town, I agree with Jamie. There's so many different aspects of it, and they might they'll pick houses on the internet. But my thought is, if you don't like where it's located, there's no point in going inside because you need to drive. I try to get them the first day that they're here. I need you to drive by all of these places that you've. You've pinpointed because you need to know whether you like that area. You may not like where it's located. You might think it's too far from the beach. You don't realize the perspective of how do I get to the beach? How do, how how does this all work? So I think you know narrowing it down, just like you say, is getting it down to the point of okay, I like where these houses are located. Okay, now let's look at houses because that's with if you don't like where it is, that's you just don't want to start there. Ninety percent of buyers have already looked on the internet, so they do come very educated to us, but a lot of times their information is not current. Like, they'll send me all these listings, but of course then, and it's really uh, interesting because a lot of them will already be pending. So you get back with them, well this one's already pending, this one's pending, so it creates a little urgency at the same time. They understand that our market is moving, we are moving real estate, people are purchasing. Michael, you asked earlier about what is our, our biggest struggle, one of our biggest struggles right now. I think exactly what they're talking about is part of that struggle. Technology is giving our buyers and sellers so much information, but they're facts about a house. They're not a feeling about an area or people or the schools or neighbors or how friendly, you know, all, all those types of things that um, are touchy-feely that you have to live in an area to know. And so buyers are coming in feeling as if they know all of this, and we're still thinking that we need to provide that information, but they, what they really need from us is a feeling of what what is an area? What does this area really represent? And we're learning how to provide that value at the same time that they're kind of thinking that they already know. It's hmm. interesting. So technology kind of desensitizes them to the warm feeling they need to get sure. if they're going to buy this house. Yeah. And so it's your challenge to say, okay, hold on. Do you understand this? Do you know what it's like to drive by and live near these neighbors who you may not like after three weeks of living here? That's interesting. Yes, yeah, it's, 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 you know, a lot of buyers think that our value is to open the door and let them in. And, um, and I think that, you know, what we have to do is we have to demonstrate that that's the least that we actually, that's the least that we provide for you. You know, it's the, you know, understanding like you're saying schools and the areas and whatnot. And, and, uh, and I think that's, that's becoming the job. You know, the job is to, you know, how do we add value to this consumer beyond opening a door? Because, you know, the, the key is, is we're all in the business of open houses. I mean, as soon as you list the property and put it on the internet, that's what, that's a virtual open house. So, you know, all of our properties are being held open every single day for everyone in the world to, to see the properties. So, you know, maybe they can't feel it, you know, at that point. They can't see the whole neighborhood at that moment. But they believe that they have just just about done everything that the realtor can do. So the, the, the key is, is to connect. Um, to connect our value with what they do not actually know is our value at this point. And how do you market that, I guess, in so many terms? Because it is the intangible. You can't say, we're going to give you that better feeling. Well, really? You are? Well, yeah, yeah we are, because we're going to show you what you can't get online. Like, you've got to come and, and the handshake goes a long way. Sure it does. And right. so if you think about Google, OK? If you were to research Google and, and, and search engine optimization, what Google is now doing is, is Google is awarding those who they believe are authority sites, okay? So now we gotta identify, well, what is authority? You know, and we probably don't know exactly what that means. We can all make our own, you know, assumptions, but I believe that an authority site is a site that offers depth. It's not just a listing on a website. It's depth, it's additional information. So we've gotta be very content heavy 
you got to have valuable content and you got to have a lot of content you know still I see people putting up these websites and they're one or two pages websites and they're featuring properties and features themselves listen you're not gonna you're not gonna be found because the Google knows what you're doing they know that you're just trying to get a quick website up there they know that you're probably putting it on a business card and you want to be seen as being able to say I have a website but they don't see that you're actually adding value to the reader and so when coming back to the time that some, when I'm monitoring how much time are they on my site then that tells me whether or not there was enough information on that site for they for them to feel like it was invested it was worth their investment of time because you know, I'm asking them to spend 10 minutes. I want them to spend 10 minutes on my website. Well, we're all busy. We don't spend 10 minutes on many websites. So the only reason they're going to invest 10 minutes in that website is if they're getting value out of it. And the value is education or it's interpretation of information. You know what strikes me is wouldn't, wouldn't it be great if behind me were a, a stands filled with rookie realtors and would be realtors to hear all of this. That'd be pretty cool.